Okay, closed captioning. Okay, there we go. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Planetary Pause series. We are very excited today to have one of my favorite people on this program, which is Caroline Casey, Weaver of Contexts. Um, I want you to completely open your minds today because this is a different program from what we usually have, but it will expand your thinking and your understanding of the world and the cosmos. And I, I think it will be a wonderful addition to the kinds of programs we normally do. Caroline Casey is the host and weaver of context uh, for the Visionary Activist radio show, which airs on Pacifica on Thursdays. Her blend of myth, comparative religions, politics, and culture is magical and deeply illuminating. Her observations are the context for deep explorations and inquiry. She views astrology as one of the great meta-languages of antiquity, uniting everything of consequence, personal and collective change, ritual magic, esoteric philosophy, the Kabbalah, Eastern and Eastern wisdom. Informed by the work of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, Carolyn offers a cohesive context for the larger planetary dramas playing out in politics and culture. She's delivered TED Talks and has been invited as nope. a keynote speaker. No? No. Oh, no. oh okay. Right. I, it's a memory of the future, maybe. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, she will be invited now that we've put that out in the ethers. Um, she's been a keynote speaker at conferences all over the world, including at Praxis Peace Institute's 2004 conference in Pacific Grove, which was called the Alchemy of Democracy. And she was the Scheherazade of the program, the weaver of context who brought the entire conference together at the very end on the last day. She's the author of Making the Gods Work For You, which I think you can get through her website or many other places. And she is an extraordinary archetypal astrologer, employing the research and observations of Carl Jung, as well as the extensive research she has done on her own. So I'm sure if any of you are interested, she would be happy to do readings for you as well. Is that correct, Caroline? For millions of dollars, yes. <laughs> no, I don't think it's millions of dollars. Millions so anyway, of, I want to... Millions yeah. of trickster dollars. Yeah. Oh, millions of trickster dollars, indeed. So I want to welcome you, Caroline. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. And and what was it you called us doing uh, the title for today, just for the fun of it? You said it was. Oh, now I. <laughs> oh, never mind. Never mind. Anyway, but but it was it was it was a good cover. It, it's yeah. it's it sounded it sounded um, informative and harmless. Um, right. so, uh, the, <laughs> That's the, what I was aiming for. We yeah, open no, the minds in real time. So <laughs> if, if any if any dementors were watching, they're like, oh, nothing to worry about here. It's not dangerous. <laughs> However, that's our cover, um, <laughs> that's because. We are, we are convening at the dark of the moon. It's a conspiratorial dark of the moon, right? And so, you know, astrology, mythology, it's just a part of our, our remedial language for us restoring cooperative intimacy with the world. So dark of moon, all traditional cultures would know is when people would gather to determine the course of culture. So, whoops, I'm having a cat transit, excuse me. Right, so we go. Um, so and so here we are, and and uh, George and I will to and fro, and we get to have lots of fun questions. But, um, but in this COVID year and ongoing experiment, you know, um, all of our craft has probably deepened, and craft means power from dedication. So I've come increasingly to appreciate astrology as a as an exquisite language of our interior psyche and its separation by a thin membrane from the whole big collective cultural and even biological conversation. Um, so I wanna bring that into play. And it's a symbolic language. It, it wants to guide humans back into intimacy with the world by being able to read it symbolically. So I'll, I'll introduce some patterns and some planets and everything real, everything symbolic. So the planets represent living qualities of intelligence that reside within each one of us and connect us to the world. So as I introduce them, you can, part of our play is that these qualities within us um, like being talked about. They're like, oh, good, whatever we speak to, you know, we, we're, we're feeding that. So that's part of our strategy also of whatever we speak to another person is the part of them we're inviting to play with the corresponding part of ourselves, ah, which is why 
you know, we're all working on this. We don't want to be, we want to be diagnostic, but not judging. Judging invites the least interesting part of somebody else to dance with the least interesting part of ourselves, and it's never pretty. Um, so part of the dynamic of now is can humans humbly cooperate with the guiding genius of nature? And you know, what um, Georgia and I were talking about backstage is in nature, when opposing forces come together, spirals ensue spiraling, spiraling. It's a keto. It's, it's hot smoke into cool air. It's cold cream into coffee. It's spiraling. And so as um, uh, undercover agents gathering now at this council of positive intrigue, right at the dark of the moon, um, great opportunity. It's, it's like, what would we like to dedicate to? And internal dedication mm, magnetizes outward opportunity is one thing we'll we'll play with. So Dark of the Moon, new moon tomorrow night, you know, Sunday night. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a stellar new moon. The sun and moon are conjoined at 22 plus Aries. There are images for each degree of the zodiac. The image for that degree is a woman carrying a precious veiled burden into the future. It's about protecting as much life as possible. And it's right next to, there's all kinds of spicy things going on. Um, Mercury in Aries to be a, a, a to give fresh expression to old things to be a voice for what we love, um, and Mercury's image just for the mysterious fun of it is uh, an Indian woman weaving a magical basket out of serpents. So just put that in your repertoire. Um, it's it's dangerous beauty, right? Making making art out of weaving different stories together, and we go ah. Well, okay. And many more fun things. Um, just one other thing too, and then I'm gonna show the chart of right now. But we look at different angles between planets, all divisions of the circle by different numbers. Um, so a square and 90 degree angle is a division of the circle by four. But tomorrow, which launches a whole season, right? It's the equinoctial new moon. <sighs> uh, this is where we finish up old business and gather our wits. And I like, um, a friend was asked what his definition of maturity was. And he said, to have access to all of one's resources. And it's like, that's a good start. So this wonderful language loves to make all of humans talents, all of our talents available to us because we have so many ways of cooperating. Language, the, the more expansive our language, the more realms of communication, the more metaphoric agility, the more we can spiral and dance. Uh, there's a statement that's, you know, cooperators are standing by and there's a lot of encouragement that, that, that says, um, oh, you humans, you provide the metaphors, we nature will provide the molecules, right? It's a collaborative endeavor. So whatever we proffer is eager to become animated. So, so the quintile, um, the sun and moon, new moon will quintile Saturn, Saturn authority, our definition of leadership. A quintile is a 72 degree angle what we get when we divide the circle by five. Five is sacred to Venus. Venus, Venus forms a five petaled orbital design over eight years. Um, and it's one of the first objective things I learned as a little tiny astrology student at the Astrological Lodge on Baker Street in England in 1971, right? Um, so I learned it as literary, but it's, but it's available to all of us. It is irresistible eloquence. And so we in, in our little class would, um, would read authors. And if they had this spicy, irresistible, brave, interesting narrative voice, we would guess if they had this pretty rare thing, because it's got to be, you know, ex exactly 72 degrees within like a degree or so. And, and then we would read somebody and go, oh, and then look and then look it up and go, oh, they did, right? So almost scientific. But the reason it's so cool, and for us all, is it's maybe the most democratic of talents and qualities available to all of us who are willing. Um, it's the capacity to hold a true perception and to be like a tuning fork in that it hums in others. So, so we don't have to convince, which means conquer, right? Uh, which creates resistance, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an offering, right? Um, so that somebody might say, you know, oh, Trudy, oh, Ben, oh, Georgia, or oh, whatever. Since you guided my vision, I see that now. So it's, it guides people to their own autonomy, crucial, and it's a long lasting influence. Just in the realm of language, it's like 
Pluto gives us a giant cauldron for tired language or just metaphoric shape shifting, you know. And um, I, I would like to toss the word impact into the cauldron because it's 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 a brand now, you know. Um, but also when people say impact investing and and it's like really you want a short violent encounter. How about a long curvy influence, you know? How about a you know more you know the, just just for the fun of it. So um, so the quintile is that, and then recently. Uh, just to step uh, expand our realm of play, uh, a wonderful colleague said, the quintile is that, Caroline, but it's also the capacity to open portals between worlds. I'm like, oh, now we're talking. All right, that's great. Um, open portals between the energetic vitality of spring into the structures of leadership and governance. And we go, oh, good. So, so part of the beauty of this language is to insource everything we've outsourced. And Saturn, because it represents authority, is the one we most tend to outsource to Father or Yahweh, or as William Blake called Yahweh, old nobo daddy, um, or, or anything that makes us cringe or wonder if they disapprove or whatever that's outsourced Saturn. And Saturn, one of its totems is our goat, right? So whenever our goat gets gotten, we see it coming back friskier and less obedient than before it got got. There we go. So inhaling our Saturn authority. Um, and this is about, you know, leadership models from nature. In fact, the whole realm of biomimicry is the sine qua non of our future. You know, um, Janine Benyus <coughs> and <coughs> E.L. Wilson. And, you know, her point is, rather than looting nature, why don't we borrow her recipes? And she's given many TED Talks. Right? And she's, uh, I, many of you may know her, but just fabulous because no one minds everyone is delighted by the elegance of the solution one of her more recent ones was um the japanese uh, high-speed bullet train was uh making a, a sonic boom as it entered and left tunnels and breaking people's windows and stuff so they go to the biomimicry institute in janine and she gets, says let's look at how a kingfisher bird enters water without a splash so they redesigned the front of the Japanese high-speed bullet train to be like a kingfisher bird entering water without a splash, no disturbances in the field. And it enters and exits the tunnel quietly. And, it's, and this moves our heart. We, we, we love these things. This is not a political party thing. It's like, oh, that is so good. Um, just, I, I should also just say in, in a meandering way, um, yeah, I am Coyote Network News. I'm a mythological news service for the uh, trickster redeemer within us all. And um, I, I, I will, you know, those of you who've listened to the radio show, and maybe it's hardly any of you, some of you have been on the show, um, but, um, you know, I, I will go anywhere to any underworld. So um, in some years past, I, I've been to CPAC twice, uh, the conservative political action, just to see if there are allies anywhere and just to whatever, and, and, and test trickster spiraling, moves right so um um and and just useful things um so there were these Ayn Rand Austrian economists and one of them even had an eye patch and really looked like a Batman villain and I was filled with maybe contempt something bad um going disdain disapproval judgment that's it I was filled with judgment so we each of us have a harumphitude composter Nom, 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 that compost serumpitude because there's no effective communication, only tantrum yoga, thank you, Steve Behrman, only tantrum yoga if we communicate without having composted our harumphitude. So they made their way over to me because I go to all these places, you know, looking like I do, right? Um, and uh, they would go, you, who are you? And I'd composted my harumphitude. And I said, I'm Coyote Network News. I'm a mythological news service for the trickster redeemer within us all. And they're like, Oh, that is so cool, right? And then we had a really interesting conversation, right? If I'd said I'm an environmental feminist and or, or, or anything, right? See, there's no prison for the unexpected, right? So tomorrow's new moon is about, for all of us, you know, just playing, like giving a fresh expression, fresh job titles to what we do. Just, you know, it, you may not tell other people, but it'll be your secret identity, your, your, your secret, uh, which then will probably become true, um, your, your, your trickster business card, right? Because it, it works, it opens paths, you know, and, um, and I was very well met. Um, 
uh, there and also at the Republican convention, uh, which is a whole other thing. But, but if we can move our emotional default setting to woof woof wanna play and, and toss many things into the cauldron and ladle out curiosity, uh, what is your story? You know, in navigating the underworld, and we've all been navigating underworld in our own customized way, and it certainly is that in the in 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 the world we're in the underworld. Um, and you know, when you meet demons, it's always a good idea to ask them what their story is. What's your story? One, because it shifts the polarity, right? Go, oh, uh, when I talk to right wingers, you know, what's your definition of leadership? Oh, what's your definition of wise governments? Like, oh. Um, and one of the most conservative people I ever met, you know, because I, I, I like to cross borders, uh, a friend of mine said, that's the most conservative person in the room, go talk to him. And we, we, we started playing and he goes, what do you know about Edmund Burke? And I go, oh, well, not much. And he goes, well, this conversation about large government, small governments, irrelevant. Um, what Edmund Burke said is the more we cultivate inner qualities of citizenship, the fewer outer laws we need. Right, this is very Saturn, and I go. That's very Saturn. That's a th this is uh, metaphysics 101. Uh, this is Taoism, and he goes Taoism. I love Taoism. I haven't been able to speak about Taoism with any of my conservative friends, and we were off and running. Um, and he's 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 a good ally. But I think that's such a useful. The more we cultivate inner qualities of good citizenship, the fewer our outer rules we need. Now, we know that cultures symbolically embedded their science in their myths, fairy tales, and symbolic languages like astrology. It's a whole other lecture, you know, but the, the, the Inanna myth is the Venus astronomical cycle and many fairy tales can, can do that. So what happened was the unsupervised Mars science team came along and said, we don't need these myths these fairy tales, these symbolic languages like astrology, fuh, fuh, fuh. we went to Harvard. Um, we want just science. Quah. So what it did was it, stri it, it stripped science of its metaphoric mythological guiding that knowledge be used always in dedication to collective well-being. And that's part of the pickle we're in that we're resolving now, but it is before the work table of all of us, Saturn in Aquarius squares Uranus in Taurus is a frame theme through this year. You know, um, best expressed by Sir Herbert Reed, great British anarchist philosopher, who said, only those serving an apprenticeship to nature can be trusted with technology. You go, right, let's, let's put things on the table. You know, I, again, against all odds are the odds that Trickster likes, right? And it's part of the dynamic um, to give to each part of our psyche the work it does best. And Saturn, authority, I think is least understood in some ways. Saturn is um, authority. It's our capacity to dedicate and to define, right? So Saturn's job is dedication and defining and taking vows, right? But Saturn's terrible at, well, how? Well, how are we going to do that? Oh, and we don't know that's not Saturn's job. We'll bring in Uranus and Jupiter. They chime in and go, we'll do how. Do common sense things as they occur, but don't let the compelling illusion of realism be an imaginative impediment to your dedication. Just dedicate it all, because if we entertain the possibility that this spring is a time of increased serendipitous synchronicity, um, then what would we want to connect with most? You know, and from Jeanine Benyus, I, I love the last time all too long ago, I hosted her on radio and I said, what is this biological term, vertical integrated hierarchy? She said, oh, it's this beautiful thing in nature. It means that everything in nature contains the plan of the larger thing it's a part of. She said, a tendon in our arm is made of twisted bundled sticks. And each one of those is twisted bundled sticks. And each one of those is micro, 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 fractal, fractal, fractal. And she said, this is what makes for nature's resilience, ingenuity, and self-assembling. So she was very happy for me to take scientific fact and turn it into mythological guidance. And I go, oh, that is so great. So as we dedicate, and this is such a great time to do it, you know, what is our manifesto of dedicated devotion for self and for world? You know, um, we increase our signal dee -dee 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 -dee, so that more, we're more likely to be danced into the larger thing that we're a part of. 
So, um, and even just the simple thing that we can kind of animate together tonight, but uh, the backstage gods, divines, whatever metaphor we want to use, um, say all you need to do is in, in own language this weekend for fun, something like <clears throat> available, you know, dance me into place where I can do the most good, have the most fun and contribute my gifts to the community in a manner of reciprocal blessing or fill in your own words. But the backstage goes, that'll do, that'll do. Um, you know, there is no certainty, you know, um, that was always true, but now we know it's true. Uh, and just a little story. Um, um, so, so the pandemic. So in 1981, I was having tea with a astrological colleague, Jim Lewis, and he would, he was just looking through the ephemeris, the listing of planets. And he said, oh my God, look at 2020. Whoa, it's the age of Capricorn. Um, and it was the sun, moon, Pluto, Jupiter, Mercury, Ceres, all conjoined at 22, 23 degrees of Capricorn on mid-January of 2020. And so in 1981, we looked at that and we went, wow, what form will the cauldron of death and rebirth take then, do you suppose? <laughs> Um, so it is all one story, and the second century medical writers wrote that pandemics occur when tyrants are in power. Right, so that's all one story, and then it's all moving, moving, shifting, you know, renaissance, emerging, power structures. So we go, hmm, and how do we cooperate with this story? But in astrology, Aquarius represents community. And to be an Aquarius, you know, God help you all, um, is really uh, a quirky, interesting thing. Uh, Aquarians are anthropologists from outer space studying curious earth customs, but they are the outsiders who constellate community. And in the language, Saturn and Uranus are called the rulers of Aquarius. But really what it means is the Aquarius part of all of us yeah, is incarnational agents of Saturn Uranus. And what is it to have a community? Saturn boundaries, Uranus wildness. You know, disciplined wildness. You know, so so um, you know, all the del we, we want to get to delusion and everything too. But but people going no masks, virus is a hoax. We got everything. We go no Saturn. You know, a boundary for collective freedom, a sacrament of democracy. Yes, what a, how how wonderful. Let's 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 play with that. Um, and um, uh, no, let's see where we want to go. Where, where where do you want to go, Georgia? I, I've been. Well, there are two things I want to bring in. First of all, because you said something about the innocuous title I gave your talk today, and I yes, just yes, yes, found right. it. And I think, yeah, it's it's a trickster title. The mythological frames that inform our politics, culture, and worldviews. No, that's right. No, it, yeah, it's it, it it no, it's a good cover. It's an it's excellent cover. It's a good cover. cover. Yes, that's right. Which I wanted to do. It's the yes. conspiratorial dark of moon council of positive intrigue. Well, the the reason. The reason I say positive intrigue is, is the utopian foyer said in any ideal community, we want to encourage the passion for intrigue. Because when people conspire to pull off something good, it draws upon more elegant parts of the psyche than just daytime. So here we are. Um, <clears throat> and Pluto would chime in and say, all of you, all of us beings, you know, whatever you call yourself, Pluto says, good cover. Right, because there's actually more and, and we want to declare inquisition over, there's still terrible things going on in the world, but it's safer for everybody to come out as an animist, really, as a, I mean, spending a lot of time, you know, in our encouraged uh, introversion, uh, I think animism is taking hold. I mean, don't we talk to the coffee cup? Hi, how are you this morning? Um, just, you know, it's, and it's, it's, I think that's a, a good thing to do. And then we think, oh, the neighbors might hear, but we know we compost you know, worrying about what other people think that so that what other people think is information, but not constraint. I think that's a fun way to, 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 uh, to go. Um, so there's a, a million ways to play in this language, but let me, um, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just show the screen of right now. Okay. Uh, and then I, I wanted to say something earlier that, that I didn't oh. mention that, yeah, I just, it's not a segue to this, but I think it's an interesting thing for people to know. Back in the 60s, there were several scientists circulating a petition among scientists to debunk astrology and to sign it and say, this isn't science, this is nonsense. And they brought it to Carl Sagan because he was famous and he refused to sign it. And he said, well, I haven't studied astrology, so I can't comment on it or sign this paper. 
And I thought he was applying the scientific method to why he refused to sign the paper. And none of the other scientists were. So I thought that was a very interesting um, lesson in a way. Yeah, it might, it might make up for some of the mean-spirited things he'd said previously about astrology, but we're, we're all nuanced. There we go. We're right. Well, I just thought it was interesting because none of those scientists were using the scientific method. They had never looked into it at all. So it was, it, to me, that was a very interesting I mean, I'm, read, I'm, I'm scanning the... John says, no prison for the unexpected mirrors the ideas in surveillance capitalism, how powerful the unprecedented is. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That feels like a taming sentence. I want to. I want to. I want to liberate no prison for the unexpected back from the surveillance capitalism word. Throwing that into the cauldron there. I feel better now. Um, so um, you want yeah, to share screen, right? Oh uh, yeah, I, yeah. I do it just for the fun of it. I, I'm just going to show the the screen of. Oops. Uh oh. Not. I'm. I have no power yet. Uh, well, because I have. I want autonomy. I haven't given it to you yet. Now I have. Ah, uh, I have autonomy. Okay, that's good. So just for the fun of it, okay, I, this is the chart of now just outside Washington, D.C., where I'm speaking to you from my little witch's house out there. Um, and it's an astrological chart of now. Um, so here's the Earth, and here's me in Washington, D.C., kind of all of us. This is the line of the horizon for fun. Um, but just to introduce the, the players uh, a little bit, um, but so, so where I am, it's, it's, it's twilight, the tide between worlds, the sun's about to set. But the sun... This is Eris, goddess of disruption. It's a planet way out in the Kuiper belt beyond Pluto, same size as Pluto, a little abstract. But what we know is anything for which we have a name, we have a relationship. So we go, well, Eris is right next to Venus. Venus is kick butt in kick butt Aries here. It's all this, what's coming out of this new moon here. And rather than say, um, you know, men and women or masculine feminine, because we all have a Venus Mars kind of quality, we go, but what is the Venusian hero or heroine different from the strictly Mars guy? The Venusian heroine, as as um, Georgia was uh, invoking Scheherazade, whose name means city redeemer and her sister means world redeemer, the, the power of the woman storyteller within all of us, regardless of gender. But this is very, in, in what way disruptive? And, and the particular image is about whirling, whirling, so spiraling, disrupting tyranny. And we go, oh, what a good idea. Um, and um, so it's a, it's a, it's a great lineup. Um, and then we have little dwarf planet Ceres Demeter, goddess of the earth. So these are all a, a language of outward symbol, inward. Uh, each one of us has a, a democracy in a different realm. Um, and then just for the fun of it, uh, Ceres' image is uh, a magic carpet hovering over drab city streets, you know, so we all have a ride. Mercury's image, what does Mercury want us to think about? Its image is leader of a nation. We go, ah, what qualities? So our word inaugurate, right? Everything is, is vital and animistic if we track it back far enough to what it be before it got orthodoxed and bamboozled. So the word inaugurate comes from the augur, um, uh, the diviner within all of us who would walk out into nature and read nature's patterns whereby the good enough person would be inaugurated. But more than that, the augur would invite in the qualities of leadership most desirable. Now, Saturn is how we define leadership. It's got this fabulous quintile to the sun and soon the moon tomorrow. Um, and Saturn is squaring Uranus, meaning so we look to nature, and, and uh, I want to get to the antidote in nature to QAnon. Uh, remind me to come back there. Okay, so um, so I, I lived with an actual coyote for 19 years and, um, and a wolf dog for some of that time as well. So I know wolves and coyotes pretty well, um, and wolves and coyotes are mating. And the leadership model of wolves is excellent. And, and part of our, our, our terrible treatment, our broken treaties, we would be nothing without wolves. Wolves taught humans silent hunting, many people think, because wolves and humans are the only mammals, it, it sounds obvious, but it's not, where the alpha wolf will look and then look back at, at a herd of elk maybe, and then look back at the pack and then look, and the pack will follow the lead wolf's gaze. It sounds obvious, but only wolves and humans do that. Um, so wolf model of leadership, wolves will play every 30 minutes, even when they're hunted, even when they're hunting, um, every 30 minutes. And psychology says, we have discovered that when people learn things, it takes about 15 repetitions to learn something. But if you learn when you're playing, it takes three, right? So 
but wolves are very disciplined and very social. Everybody's got a rule. There, there are group rules for the collective well-being of the pack. No other species would outsource their Saturn authority to a sociopathic dingbat who did not care about collective well-being. Only us. I mean, really. Um, but so wolves, very disciplined. Coyotes, here we go. Yornus is nature's wild against all odds, ingenious coyote, raven, seeds that sprout after cataclysm against all odds kind of thing. Coyotes, no. Uh, mad, genius, uh, no rules, break things, whatever. So the mating as an evolutionary assist of wolves and coyotes, you know, is wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it feel great for us all to have and contribute to a supportive wolf pack that encouraged everyone's mad trickster genius. Disciplined wildness, disciplined wildness, right? And it's also why, um, you know, we, we say, well, everybody here increasingly come on out as a heretic uh, because heretic was a term of praise in early religion. Boy, that Georgia Kelly sure is a great heretic because it means free thinker, cross pollinator, bringer in of new ideas right? That was a good thing. Uh, heretic. Only once we had a priesthood, when we'd outsourced our Saturn to an external authority that mediated between us and nature and the divine, and it runs on fear, you know, would it get us killed, right? So that's why we do want to kind of say inquisition over everybody out as an animist. And, you know, I, I know that the straightest of people, you know, if you convince them that all this stuff is smart, you know, will kind of relax. And, um, uh, Taurus is the realm of living participatory animism and biomimicry and indigenuity. And years ago, I was giving a seminar to a pretty grown up group of people in Chicago, um, uh, entrepreneurial phila philanthropists, right? And I was talking about Taurus as intrinsically animistic. Um, you know, it knows that, you know, everything's telling us its story all the time by shape and color and song and rhythm. And if we just approach the world with informed, reverent curiosity, we'd be back in the choreography and the dance, you know? Um, and I said that I had a, a client, Taurus, and, and she said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, I build walls and they last forever because I always invite the stones to hang together, right? And great kahuna allies in Hawaii said, well, that's the tale the kahunas tell before a big project, you know, they would walk out into the land and ask what stones wanted to be part of the project and the stones that volunteered would carry half their weight. Lovely participatory animism as a, as a, a, a living fun, you know, idea. And Martine Prechtel says, you know, humans and rudeness was the oil invited to come out. Was it invited to become plastic? Was it invited to become a computer? No manners. Uh. So at this workshop in Chicago, um, I talk about Taurus and this man comes up who's doing beautiful work. He's buying distressed neighborhoods, not making people move, uh, having people contribute um, to, to redesigning the neighborhood. Uh, so it's got cul-de-sacs and koi ponds and things. And he said, um, I'm a Taurus um, and I've never told anybody this, but I always ask the trees where they want the window. And I go, you're safe with me, but you can come out now. You're a grown up influential guy. And he's like, I'll wait until now. Anyway, so so just that model of everybody out. Did, were you, did you want to say something, Georgia? Uh, no, I was just looking at something. But I I realized that when you mentioned heretic, which I, uh, the meaning of that, which was different than we've all been told, um, I was called uh, her, a heretic when I was a sophomore in Catholic high school for believing, not believing in some of the things that we were taught to believe and believing in things we were taught not to believe. So I had de a definite different understanding of that term and I'm glad you've redefined it. Well, that gets us to QAnon. That's great, that's a good bridge. Um, okay, right? that's great. Because, um, so in, in listening to Mary Trump's book, a brilliant title, Diagnosis of America, Too Much and Never Enough, right? Mm. Uh, um, you know, it's, it was really good. Um, and, and I go at the end going, well, the, the virus is a marvel of symmetry and a primary reality and metaphor given to us, meaning it, it locks right in, right? Just ingenious. And, and when, I, when I was listening to Mary Trump's book, I go, well, what part of the uh, national psyche was receptive to the delusional tyranny virus? Poof. 
Um, and then I go, well, I want to turn to nature because as, as many of you know, um, there's no talking people out of delusion. Mm -hmm. Illusion comes in Ludo, in the game. Delusion is de Ludo, out of the game. So you can't convince, right? You, you may, maybe, maybe quintiles, you know, but, um, but, but I think backstage work uh, such as uh, our elders, our ancestors would do at such a time right now. Uh, here's just an image that to, to offer to you all. So honey badgers and possums are immune to cobra venom. And cobra venom is another marvel of symmetry, like a virus. It locks right into mammalian breathing. But honey badgers and possums have evolved to shapeshift their receptors so the venom no longer fits. So they eat snakes. Right. I'm not, uh, um, and the article I read said it's it's like you're the only person who likes hot salsa at the buffet. It's all for you. Snakes. I like eating snakes. So I like thinking of using our backstage as well as on stage considerable powers of imagining. We provide the metaphors. You know, Trickster will provide the molecules to imagine the the nation's psyche shape shifting the receptors shape shifting so that the despotism tyranny delusion virus no longer fits right it's it's you know there's a tradition of this but just put that in your pipe and smoke it um just as a, a, a i think i think it's one interesting good way to go and there are many precedents you know kind of for that but um but yeah everything from nature but but in wondering you know what is the QAnon thing and thank you catholic church <clears throat> um going <laughs> what gives rise to this and I go, dogma, because QAnon has swept through the spiritual astrological yoga communities. You know, it's like, it's just like, wow. And I go, dogma, once you have outsourced your Saturn by believing something that you have not, that we have not earned, we're open to the tyranny virus. And the other thing that goes with it is only one story. It's got a lot of compensatory condescension. You look down on us, now we know and you know nothing. It's very polarity, right? And so it's a crucial again that not, not you know, to spiral out of polarity, you know, the art of peace and Aikido, excellent. Do not gaze at your enemy's weapon. He will terrify you. Do not gaze at his eyes. He will mesmerize you. Create your own magnetic field and then you can stand anywhere you like, right? All of these strategies you know, George and I were talking, I, I, I like the, we're talking about mentors, past mentors, being a mentor, having mentors, and, you know, and all be foibled, all be foibled. I mean, I've been backstage to many, many great, important teachers, right? And we're all be foibled, absolutely, you know, some more than others, you know, but, um, but I think it's, it's trickster fun to think of many of our mentors had keys, but they didn't necessarily put them in the lock and used it. Like, oh, you mean apply it? And now who brought what to this Renaissance? You know, anything we've ever studied or loved or, you know, political, spiritual, everything, it's like, let's experiment and see what this is. Not believe it. I want to go back to dogma for a moment. Because I, like yourself, was uh, early Catholic and I sort of got the gist of it, you know, for confirmation. Uh, I, I read the Book of Martyrs and picked who won, because that it clearly was a kind of sadomasochistic, erotic, kinky religion. Um, and I picked Agatha. Everything bad happened to her. But but I remember uh, as a precocious heretic, um, I, I'm playing in my dollhouse, so I'm that young, right? And I remember going, Nicene Creed. No. I believe in one God, the only God, the only church. And I was like, no, absolutely not. And then when the nun said that animals didn't have souls, I'm like, you know nothing. I am out of here. Right, uh, and, I, and I was. Um, but back to back to the QAnon thing, um, the hunger for story and belonging. What does this want to be? And it's gotten way whacked out. And you might have noticed, you know, people who've contributed really good things to culture have gotten completely, you know, bad shit. Um, um, and there's always kernels of truth going. Yeah, yeah, big pharma, bad. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, wow, there we go. Um, into de ludo, into out of the game and belief structures. So I like to say, believe nothing, entertain possibilities. Um, you know, and because even if we believed in the truth due to some fluke, we're still outsourcing our Saturn, entertain possibilities, you know, until we know that thing. And in this language, um, Johannes represents trickster and ingenuity and all of these things in us, right? It, it's our inner 
again, the, the part of us that likes against all odds, right? There's other parts that are like, whoa, whoa. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, crisis is inventive time, you know, uh, ingenuity. So Saturn Uranus as part of the pulse for everybody in a customized way, because the entire world conversation pours into each of our psyches in some customized way. So we all belong, our private lives also belong to culture. So we're allowed to have a private life, but to tease from even the most deeply personal of circumstance, kind of larger guiding principles, like to, to not resist, to kind of spiral, to um, start with the dedication. And then with, with any group, you know, it's like start with the desirable vision that can be agreed upon and work backwards. If one starts with realistic, um, you know, how everybody goes to war. If your city blooms, mine won't, you know, um, and, and I've test driven all these things, you know, um, it's like, start with the vision. And even I, I have a, I have a pet QAnon troll um, <clears throat> that I keep for training purposes, because it says outrageous, you know, vile and violent, ugly things. And I go, all right, here we go. Um, but at one point, um, it's on Facebook, but she said, um, oh, that animal video, you know, we QAnon conservative people, we, we like animals too. And I go, okay. Um, a wonderful life, a world where there's a wonderful life for the children of all species. She's like, yes. I go, all right, that's good. We're going to leave that here. I'm going to tiptoe away because that's a good play. That's right. And we'll work with that thing. So it's like, start with the vision and then avenues of possibility, especially this spring, open up that weren't immediately apparent, but entertain the possibility, not to believe it, but entertain the possibility that this is a, a dance step. You know, um, you know, and go, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll play with that. Um, so, 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 so yeah, I think what I'd like to do now, because this has been fascinating, Carolyn, really, really great. I would like to open it up for people in the audience to ask questions. And when I call on you, you can unmute yourself, but otherwise please keep mute because we are recording. Mm. So who would like to ask or make a comment from this so wonderful presentation today? To raise your hands, you can go down to the reactions uh, button. If you click on reactions, you should see a raise hand option in that little sub window. Assuming you're on the screen where you see all of our faces, that helps us retain order when right. when calling. I, I, feel, people. I feel like I have to edit the chat section. <laughs> anyway, oh, never. that's okay. We can do that later. I'm saving the chat. Right, all right. And there's some mistakes in it that I have already seen. So, well, because dogma does not always contain kernels of truth. I'm, I'm quite language spe specific. Um, delusion, okay. delusion and cults contain so. No, dogma is more external Saturn going blah, 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 blah. Um, but um, yeah. Okay, well, that we'll, we'll get that corrected. Uh, all right, any questions? I think you've just made everyone dumbfounded. Oh, could be. <laughs> could be. Oh, here's Cheryl. Okay, Cheryl, do you want to... Uh, Ask it, unmute. Unmute, unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, Carolyn, you talked about how in 1981, you saw that in 2020, it was going to be a time of great re death and rebirth. Yeah. As you look forward astrologically, what do you see coming up for us all? Ah, uh, see, the, the question that has gone into the compost pile this year is, um, especially as an astrologer, people go, what's going to happen? And the backstage god goes, no, irrelevant question. What are we going to make happen? Um, what's available to play with? It's it's all see the yeah you know, the backstage ancient world says you know certainty was always a booby prize, but now it's a booby prize for you know nobody gets it. Um, look, the humans have run out of certainty. Now mystery can find them. How good! A round of applause for humans. Oh. Right? But then I also really love um, this. You know, again, many perspectives. So I, I work with a wonderful ally, Deborah Felmuth, who's lived a great deal in Syria. And um, it was last summer solstice that she said, um, in Western culture, we think of the future, but in front of us, it's progressive, right? And the past in back of us, who cares? Right? And she says, in the Middle East, it's the reverse. We're gazing at the past in front of us, and we're crafting the future by gazing at the caravan of our past mentors. And I really like that as one lens, right? So, and, and, then, and then there's also, you know, a, 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 a more respectful response to your question um, as well. But that's, that's one going, well, what are we going to do? So nothing's going to happen to us. 
right? Um, although astrology, you know, um, is descriptive uh, as embodied in the word disaster, which means this is against asters the stars when we pit our small will against the larger pulse. So Saturn Uranus on a descriptive level is what we know anyway. All Saturn structures of social support are collapsing. Uranus under crisis, Texas grid goes down. I'm, I'm quite fond of Bo, Bo's commentaries, uh, Cultivated Redneck on YouTube. Um, but there was a great moment when he, um, um, uh, was it was it was the same day that Texas collapsed, and he was giving survival videos, going, "No, don't burn your fence inside; it'll it'll kill you. The fumes will kill you. Heat rocks outside in a fire and bring them into your tent, whatever." Uh, the same day that that NASA's um, uh, persistence, uh, perseverance, little rocket landed on Mars, and he goes, "Stone Age technology, or Star Trek? You know, take your pick. Same day, right?" And it's just like, "Oh." It got um, and we can go over that. So Saturn Uranus, it's a collapse. It's a collapse of systems and everything into the cauldron, but but also a, a little, a little tolerance from uh, those of us who label ourselves progressives. Um, you know, really, you know, magic is a willingness to cooperate with everything. Uh, and I had a friend who um, uh, was running a progressive campaign and said, "What a nightmare tyrant that person was!" <laughs> right? Uh, and then she went to go work for Biden in the last days in Pennsylvania. She being working class Pennsylvania person, and she said, "You know, early on, she goes, you know, Biden's progressive can take a lot of credit. You know, he's he's changing. The pandemic is changing him. The thing is changing him. You know, work with this guy. He's the guy we didn't know we needed. You know." And I go willing to, you know, because because there is, you know, again, our team, if we could give up our addiction to righteous finger wagging disappointment, and I call it the, the despotism of um, because you explain that you go, well, this is a good thing. Yeah, but if you knew it all sucks, it's all a neoliberal con. I got neoliberal, another word I'd like to throw into the cauldron, because it's like academic, divorced, left wing, condescending. Anyway, that's my, okay, there we go. Again, reinvent language, reinvent language. Language. But 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 your worthy question, you know, what are we going to design together into the cauldron? What are we ladling out? Infrastructure, yeah, and much to work with, much much imperfect, absolutely. Keep on the thing, you know, and yay, Deb Holland and all kinds of you know work. So critique, discourage the bad, encourage the good, simultaneous. You know, it's 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 dog training as well. It's um and it's it's you know we're we're the wind. You know, leaders are the sails. Um, you know, and and we we glean from all over. I was reading this pretty fun article in Conscious Parenting magazine and said you don't say to your three year old, oh please put on your shoes because mommy's got to get to work because your three year old has no prefrontal cortex. You go, we're putting on our shoes. That's what's happening. There we go. And I think that's a good way to work in politics because politicians have no prefrontal cortex either. You go, <laughs> we're rebuilding the environment. We're going. That's where we're going. This, come on, we're a magnetic field, right? Irresistible eloquence. This is what's happening. Happening. This is, you know, and synchronicity in the thing. So a willingness to cooperate, you know, a composting of the despotism of um, you know, going and, and uh, addiction to having an enemy. I think that would be great to throw into the cauldron, you know, but anything you can think of that's an impediment. But yeah, again, just correcting some of the language here, our manifesto of dedicated devotion. Um, what are we, what are we dedicated to? Because Jupiter chimes in and says, everybody, you know, I will make you wealthy by your definition of wealth, which is not money necessarily, doesn't exclude that, but that's another great, interesting conversation. Um, you know, um, and, and for each person, what's a wealthy life? What's a wealthy culture? And we know and are reminded by this new moon in our hearts, a wealthy culture protects life. It protects its children its storytellers, its environment, its elders. It has the capacity to negotiate working alliances across species borders. You know, we, we know this somewhere deep inside all of us humming going, right, right. You know, and by that measure, of course, you know, uh, everything vulnerable has been slung, you know, everything of, of value has been slung shot into vulnerability, but the tide is changing. There's great cuckoo-ness, you know, but, but the, the movement I find quite heartening and engaging, you know, um, there are collaborators. And, and I think, you know, what's going to happen, collapse of structures, it, you know, in our own personal life, 
you know, the old forms are going, the, the forms in which we have defined ourselves are going, but the energy that was in them is available for rededication. Same in the culture. Um, you know, so the forms are going, and but the energy invested in them is available for revisioning and redesigning. So absolutely, this can be a time of extraordinary renaissance and ingenuity and inventiveness. It's, it's dodgy, right? We got, we got to keep a wary eye, um, you know, um, going, no, 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 geoengineering, uh-uh, put your hands up and back away from the geoengineering, like, no. Um, and I guess just for, for positive intrigue, fun, you know, myths, fairy tales, detective novels, very related themes. And I, I love detective novels because there's always accountability, right? I, I was reading it during the whole last four years because at the end of a detective novel, Saturn, people are brought to accountability. And this country has a very conflicted relationship to con men. Um, uh, there's a, a brilliant um, movie based on Patricia Highsmith's um, uh, novel. Uh, what's it called? Anyway, in the, the French version, it's fabulous. It's about a con man. Oh, it's, it's great noir. And at the end, a uh, wonderful comeuppance in which, in which he has sowed the seeds of his own justice coming to get him. The American version, the amazing Mr. Ripley, the con man never gets caught. It's like America, America, the con man is not the trickster. The con man is imprisoning, the trickster is liberating. And, and, and everything can be imprisoning or liberating, language, politics, belief system, I mean, whatever, imprisoning or liberating, right? And, and so we want in the American psyche to be able to be savvy to the con, so detective novels. Um, so I was wondering, you know, how old are detective novels? You know, and see, wonder attracts synchronicity. And I go, oh, 231 BC in China uh, are the oldest detective novels we've found so far on bamboo paper, so it holds up. And they are pitching to us. Everything's trying to help the modern rogue humans going, oh, you guys, God, and Gaia's. Um, and they said, the purpose of the detective is to dive into the underworld in order to restore human affairs to be in accord with the mandate of heaven and earth. We go, right, that's it. That's what we got to do. Um, and they said, if you're going to do that, it's good to have a couple of buddies to go down into the underworld with you with whom to trade heartening dark humor and spice. So I, I always ask people, you know, we're in the underworld. Do you have a couple of buddies, you know, the, who, who are dark humor, spice? And that's, that's a, a wealth. And it's part of also my love of reframing relationships because Venus is squaring Pluto. God knows what's going on with relationships um, in an interesting way. It says relationships depend on both people being dedicated to something larger than themselves, you know, and, um, you know, and, and also just the language going, well, do we want a life partner oh, or, you know, or, you know, a spouse? Um, and then spiciness says, how about an accomplice? And people go, oh, an accomplice. That's a much more fun idea. It's, 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 I think it's good for now. So the detective novel said, you want some accomplices, you know, and they said, if you go into the underworld, your greatest protection is authenticity. It's a Saturn thing, right? Do, do a, does our inner dedication match our outer structure of our life? Are our words, our stories, our metaphors, and our actions in accord with democracy, in accord with our dedicated hearts, you know, or let that be an aspiration? See, the, the, the shadow, you know, of compensatory condescension is like not democratic. Uh, uh, um, and trickster says, um, Johannes Trickster is genius and coyote and everything. And then the last ideas associated with it are democracy, equality, synchronicity. Now we're into the realm of ally etiquette. And no wonder did I, no sooner did I wonder, like, what do democracy, equality, and synchronicity have to do with each other? Then events stage themselves to make clear when we look down at somebody or up at somebody, there's no synchronicity, no magic. Mm -hmm. um, we can all have different roles. But the only real way to, to, to woof woof is straight across. Hey, how you doing? You know? And so, and, and I know this is true. It, it's good news because it means the Dementors of Doom you know, may have more money and lawyers, but no synchronous magic, this condescending thing. But people could lose their magic 
like being condescending, right? But but the transformational culture, if we ally etiquette, if we treat each other well, not nicely, because nice comes from nescient, which means ignorant, but with a kind of spicy, playful, woof woof, equal regard. Yeah. And so in the same way, the Chinese detective novel said, in the underworld, your greatest protection is authenticity, because here's what will happen. Demons and bad people will come up and go, I was going to rob you and kill you. But I can feel that you're for real. So I want to change teams. I want to be on your team. But I have underworld skills you will need. Welcome. Now, and I love that for now. In the spirit of noir, right, and detectives, you know, it's like, welcome. And we will keep a wary eye because all of your story might not match all of our story. Helpful Republicans getting rid of Trump, you know. But, but, but yeah, absolutely. So I talked to a fair number of whistleblowers, you know, who were like, we did terrible things for the NSA for 40 years, but we want to be good now. It's like, all right, yeah, we're recruiting agents. Who brought what? Um, <clears throat> um, you know, and I, and I think that quality of inv wary, informed, invitational, expansive tolerance is part of our renaissance. Um, and then, you know, asking the demons, what's your story? And, and that works also even for viruses. Very, very, very interesting. I, I, we have another question, and I wanted to just comment on something you said a couple of minutes ago about Ripley not being accountable because he was never caught. Uh, yeah. The, which is, I, th I think, a fascinating take on the difference between the French version and the American version of the story. Yeah. Because in America, the, the libertarian idea is that he gets free. He's not accountable. He can do what he wants. Oh, poor. I, 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 is, that, is that true of libertarians? I'd hate to think so, but if that could well, be Well, there. there is that side where there's, there, they get by with things because that's their freedom. I mean, not that they would think that the that a criminal well, thing is America, right. No, but yeah, I America think the idea of the America. story plays into that thinking. I really do. That's I think that's yeah. why it's well. That's American. why that's why the American psyche has been so receptive to the right. to the to the con that's, virus. That's what I meant. Because it, it can't tell the difference between despotism and con, um, right? And so putting our standards, you know, I think is a is a great thing to do. Yeah. Well, let me go to some questions because we got a few people who want to ask. We have Iris first. Do you want to unmute, Iris? Thank you. Um, as you as you speak, Caroline, I, I think of uh, if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. Um, it's old stuff, but a question I have at this time: um, people seem to be pretty apathetic. Um, people in general in the population uh, seem pretty apathetic. And I, I'm doing an organizing thing around emergency preparedness, oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which also is, I think, a way of organizing community. But um, apathy is a big issue in talking to people. And I'm wondering what Caroline has what well, kind of suggestion you have? I'd, I'd say let's throw apathy into the cauldron this weekend. Um, <laughs> okay, it's fine with me. <laughs> well, remember, you remember the Hafez um, quote, the small man builds prisons for everyone he meets, but the wise person ducks under the moon and tosses keys to the beautiful and rowdy prisoners. I, I think it's an excellent description that, that <clears throat> sidesteps martyrdom. So it says, well, one's job is to throw a key, you know, um, and, and also to just as an experimental frame on some level, personally and collectively, we're all directing the movie. I, I, I love the model of complicity, not shame, not blame, but whatever's going on, we are contributing chi to, to that dynamic. Um, <clears throat> and if we play with that, <coughs> excuse me, if we play with that, you know, we can go, well, I'm gonna withdraw my creative chi from that story and throw that story into the cauldron and ladle out a more fun one. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I've gone into many, you know, what, what is what is apathy? So um, you're organizing emergency preparedness. So yeah, so are you, are you working with FEMA or on your own? So well, I, I accidentally muted her. <laughs> Do you want to unmute yeah. yourself? It's a program that's designed to be really grassroots. It's organizing your own neighbors you know, of uh, 15 or 20 households mm -hmm. um, 
and and then creating um and as someone who's working on organizing that uh encouraging other people to organize their neighbors right and and having it grow i, I would recommend you know a fun colleague for yourself is is Bo on youtube b-e-a-u um because um he's talking about just that um, and they will be, when they travel again, they're going to communities to organize, you know, emergency preparedness. And each one of his short little talks on community organizing, it's about 1.5 million views. Um, and, it's, and it's all kinds of people. Um, and um, there is a, a receptivity and a hunger for exactly what you're dedicated and devoted to. Um, and it's just that idea of just that little connecting spark, like what's the thing, you know? And, um, and, and this weekend you, you are, you get to, if you want, you get to have irresistible magnetic in, um, eloquence as part mm -hmm. of your skill set, and then, you know, and then and then you just get to decide, you know, how. how but he talks about that, and he says, um, you know, in one of his past little eight-minute things, pretty interesting. <clears throat> it's 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 actual political community education, and don't always are you know agree, you know, but but always informed and interesting. And he said, you know, everybody, we're all going to need our affinity groups. And this is part of our conversation about community and government. And he says, um, you know, I'm in 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 rural, uh, you know, Panhandle, Florida. Um, and he said, an affinity group doesn't need to be people you know particularly well, but it's who brought what. And it's he said, my affinity group. He says about 13 is about kind of a natural number that tends to coalesce. And he said it's uh, made up in almost entirely of left-wing anarchist libertarians and right-wing small government conservatives, Republicans, right? And we all work together. And it's the idea that you see uh, the road needs a pothole. Well, you could complain to the government like, oh, the government pothole, or who knows how to do that? Okay, let's just do that and get this thing done. So it's a great conversation about community mutual aid, which I view as rising. I mean, there is there are impediments and, and, and all of that, um, but, it, but there's a, a receptivity you know, and a quickening and, and government, you know, going, right. It's a conversation government. I, I mean, my dad was a new deal congressman working with FDR. So new deal, good to me, you know, and what can a government do? Um, and I think, you know, there's some good things going on right now. Um, you know, um, Medicare for all, I mean, it's insane. I went through an incredible, you know, medical underworld experience and I was like, oh my God, if I'd had to pay for that, whoa, Oh my God! It might as well just die, you know. I mean, and it's like unbelievable. So, so, so these common sense things, you know, have a, an increasing. But also, I think the, yeah, I know people who used to work for FEMA doing emergency preparedness, and then they were too much fun, and FEMA got rid of them. But they're still doing it, which is storytelling um, and many things, and 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 preparing and ingenuity, but also practical stuff like. Um, Who's got a project in their neighborhood they'd like help with? We'll we'll move around, you know. All right, we'll fix that pothole. We'll do that thing. We'll do so, you know. And and your manifesto of dedicated devotion, you know, just to entertain the possibility that, you know, our manifesto dedicated devotion and to see, what it would look like. In a, in a way that is desirable to you, like what would that look like, right? And see, that's where we're. You know, see the QAnon thing, you know, and, and a lot of the articles that have been written about, you know, the new age roots of QAnon, and I, and I read them eagerly and then go, oh, these are really shallow, right? Because you, you got to know, um, you know, the, the true kernel of the power of imagination, yes, although a lot of leading teachers and health people have gone really nuts, um, right? But to experiment, every tradition pretty much agrees that and, and modern science is beginning to prove that, that molecules in our mind are the same as molecules in this table. I, I went to a pretty good um, uh, presentation because we have science proving folklore now all over the place. It's very cool, the entheogenic wing. We'll see if we have time to get to entheogens. But, um, but uh, Francis Collins, head of NIH, gave a pretty good evening uh, at the Kennedy Center a couple of years ago on music and healing. Um, and he did uh, two remarkable things. One, he said, when we hear music that gives us goosebumps, our brain cascades a huge surge of dopamine and endorphins. Like it's got a physical thing. Um, and he showed a video of a man with advanced Parkinson's, right? Which is a dopamine deficiency. And the man could barely walk and gets to a door and can't open it. 
And then Francis Collins said, head of NIH, said, all we did was put on a metronome, tick, 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 and the man's walking steady, gets to the door, opens it, goes through it. And then he said, he had an he opera singer in an MRI. <clears throat> and he said, now, even though you're lying down, sing an aria, right? So we could see her brain and, and, and two or three parts of the brain go, whoa, it's beautiful. And then he says, now don't sing, just imagine singing. And the entire brain lit up. <clears throat> we go, wow, imagining engages the entire brain electrically. Right? And then there was another thing uh, science uh, psychologists have discovered that when we commune with an invisible something, it's the same in our brain as talking to a good friend in the kitchen with a cup of tea. Our brain is democratic. Visible and invisible are equally real. So if sports, everything people say, you know, and, and, I, and I know this is true. We're going to go to the next question soon, Carol. <laughs> what? We're going to go to the next question because... Okay. Uh, I, th I think we'll only take maybe one more, possibly two, but I have one that's been waiting for a while, so I okay. want to get to her. Mary McDevitt, do you want to unmute? Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, first, let me say I am new to this, um, so forgive my posing this question if it isn't correct, but if you have someone that buys into uh, a common vision but just can't change their perspective to support it, what power is working on them at that point? Well, what do you mean buy into? Buy into what? Well, um, I'm, I'm a physician. I'm interested in Medicare for all, and I talk to a lot of people about it. And uh, sometimes you get the reaction, uh, well, yeah, you know, that sounds nice, but I just can't support that. And very little reason. And I'm just wondering in your frame of perspective, what what could be going on there? I think part of our um, excellent trickster repertoire skill set is um, no one minds being asked, did you know? You know, and I remember, you know, after the first Iraq war, when the bombing started, and I went to a gathering, and it was artists, and I assumed to prevent the war, and everybody was mouthing platitudes, like, well, at least there was no choice, and at least there were smart bombs. I'm like, ah, just the purpose of artists, there's always another way. Um, and people were, were, were very, like, who do you think you are, right? And so a wonderful friend said, nobody minds being asked, did you know? Did you know that the uh, Kuwaitis were slant drilling oil into Iraq. You know, did you know? Did did you know? Did see the more we know, the more effective we are because nobody. You know, we can ask it with attitude. You know, snark. But but if we ask, you know, did you know about you know all these things you're learning in praxis? You know, this this place where you can go tuition free. Did you know about you know um, you know the healthcare systems here? Did you know? Did you know about this? Did you know about? Yeah. Did did you know? People like that, and then see you're in a conversational dynamic. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, you know, did you know how these people, do, to be a heretic, how these people do it? Do you, do you know, um, you know, um, do, do, and, and also, you know, um, well, just now in a pandemic, right? Did, did you know that, no, did you know that wolves always look at, give healthcare to the members of their pack? Did, did you know, I mean, wherever you, where you go, and again, just even a little unexpected, bringing all of your cultivation you know, um, we are cultivated people, each by our specific dedication and the history of healing, you know, lives in your DNA. And, and I love um, Matthew Arnold saying, to be cultured is to be acquainted with the highest possibilities of the human spirit throughout time, you know. And so for each one of us to go, well, did you know about this? And did you know about these societies? So, so for us to be cultivated, informed and playful and the art of, did you know? Because because that spirals the thing, you know, and um, just an example. I mean, I, I, I talked to in, in you know, uh, just one small example at CPAC, you know, a guy going, no regulations, no EPA, no nothing, because I want to play the games that I want to play. And, I, and so I step in and I go, well, that's interesting, because the essence of games is rules. And he's like, oh, I hadn't thought about that, you know. And I said, you know, in fact, on this planet, there's limits. There's only so much water. That's it. That that. And he's like, oh, oh. I guess I better rethink my what did you call it metaphor. And I go, yes, yes, go do that. That's good. Anyway, so, and he like he had a good time. Um, 
at the Republican convention, you know, very right wing Baptist Trump supporter. And, you know, we're talking, and I go, do you want to play a game? And he goes, I love games. I go, I'm going to give you a list of quotes and some are from ISIS and some are from Trump. And you tell me which is which. He goes, okay. Right. And I go, we must destroy the world in order to recreate it. And he goes, that's Trump. And I go, no, that's ISIS. And he goes, ha, got me. Anyway, so I'm just encouraging us all in this realm. And, and you go, in case I have been complicitous, all of us, you know, in, you know, getting no response, let me expand my repertoire and entertain the possibility that irresistible eloquence is bestowed on all dedicated hearts <laughs> by Sunday night, um, in which you go, well, let's try this again, you know, um, and experiment, experiment, experiment. Um, you know, um, and, and asking the question, you know, what would make you interested? I know I'm not interested. What would make you interested in that? You know, mm -hmm. what, what would, the, what would be interesting to you? You know, have you, yeah, um, yeah the, the questions. And um, I guess one last little, little thing, you know, um, in, in, in having a colleague, a, a doctor who, who is also a mythologist and we also had, had a shared daunting diagnosis in the underworld that we journeyed through together. And she said, you know, when you meet demons in the underworld, always ask them their story. And she said, um, yeah, like the virus. And she said, um, uh, 20 years ago, she was uh, a doctor uh, in New York and uh, the night watch in a ward where people had a very dangerous lung virus and some people had died and it was highly contagious. And so she being a doctor and a pragmatic mystic um, experimenting, in her time there, it decided to talk to the virus going, what's your story? And then she's like, oh, you don't want to be in New York, man, you're tropical. Right? So she spent the night, you know, conjuring in her mind, you know, a warm tropical cave, right? That no human was going to go in, right? Going, that's where you want to be. And in the morning, the day doctor comes in and goes, no new cases, everybody's stable. It's good. Just experiment. Just experimenting, you know, and 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 being unexpected. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think yeah, it's a, a play. Unexpected is okay. I'm going to take one last question. Let's try and make this one short because we're getting close to out of time. So, Lori, you want to ask something? Sure, um, Caroline. I I just know that there are a lot of people who, after this pandemic, are suffering from major depressions. So. If I'm gonna throw that into my cauldron this weekend, okay, what's one thing that I could do in talking to a depressed person that you would recommend other than saying that they subscribe to you, okay, in any podcast they can find of you sure. and Bo. Well, that's okay. very darling, that's very darling. Um, and, and you, and you, whatever rascal work you're up to. Um, <laughs> um, wait, wait, where'd you go? Come back. I'm right. here. Okay, so okay. I so I just wanted to say what's the one thing that you would say say in this short space of time, okay, to do. Well, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty playful in a way that I've earned part of the thing I love about this language when I work in private sessions or collective with people and hear really daunting stories. I mean, people have gone through a lot. You know, and I say as humans we go, "Oh." But as symbolists we go, "God, you're right on schedule." You know, and Saturn says depression is still too shallow. Go deeper, go deeper. Redemption lies in dedication to something larger. You know, go go deeper. It's still too shallow, and and I I all we all remember these crucial things that are bubbling up for us. Sometimes our shadow is really good stuff, and um, I had a, a woman in in person in those days. You know, come for a reading, and she was in a truly dangerous relationship. Uh, marriage, physically dangerous, and couldn't, wouldn't leave for all the reasons we kind of know. And I go, okay. But the entire team of women in similar circumstances is counting on you. And she's like, really? Whoa, well, fucking hell. Went home, kicked the guy out, got a resist, opened a women's shelter. Boom. It's like, sometimes we will do for others what we wouldn't do for ourselves. And I think that's a depression antidote going deeper, go deeper than depression. Redemption lies in brewing medicine for others, you know? And, and you, know, you know, in my psyche and the body politic, may this be composted, right? I find that quite practical. So um, 
Yeah. Yes, and and then whatever whatever you asked, it's a deep and fabulous question that we could go forever on. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, that's yeah. really really great. This has been fabulous, Caroline. I I've actually saved the whole chat for those of you who came in late and everybody. You will get the recording on our YouTube channel of this probably tonight, so you'll get the whole program. I know some people had to come in late, some people couldn't make it at all, so they will get it later as well. So this has been fascinating. I'm going to listen to it again because I've loved every bit of it. One more trick up my sleeve, just one last little well wishing. Can I do that? Sure. Okay, just so for everybody, just think of your customized trickster wise loves against all odds self, right? That's being born by, you know, Sunday night, your brave, daunting self. And then we get to pull it over a hat. There we go. There we go. It's very good. <laughs> Okay, so there it is. There it is. We use the expensive technological props. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. And Jennifer. I've also put in your um, your coyotenewsnetwork.com slash readings for people who might be interested in having a reading. Yes, coyotenetworknews.com uh, readings. Yeah, that's that's that that is a wonderful thing also. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Caroline. This has been thank fabulous. You. My pleasure. Thank you, Caroline. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Good. We're happy. Ah, uh, very excellent, wonderful. Oh, Jody, God, uh, all these people. But I didn't yeah, get people to you hi. know. <laughs> yes, hi, hi, everybody. That's really great. That uh, was everybody. awesome and nourishing. Thank you so much. Oh, dar That's darling, great. there you are. Look at you with your fantastic hair. You look adorable and fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. She is. <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right, wonderful. Well, a great delight. Uh, I guess I'll leave. So okay. leaving, leaving the party. It's hard to you know, work. Sometimes people don't leave for a while. They hang out like it's the back of the room. Well, people are ordering. Let's let's all smoke up. That's, there we go. That's or whatever. That's, 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 everything's that's linked to as well. Say what? I, said, I just said everything's linked to in the chat. So if you save chat, you'll have um, all of those websites and whatnot. That's oh, super cool. great. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. And 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 I do like um you know um. E.L. Wilson and Janine Venus created a website um, called asknature.org and it comes up with a question box and you type in any design conundrum question you have and it tells you how nature solves it. It's really oh. cool. Oh, he posted a, there. a link to that and and the youtube channel you mentioned was uh Bo um it's Bo, yeah B, column, B, right? B, it's just b-e-a-u it's it's Bo of the fifth something or other okay um, cool. i'll just make a try yeah. link the right one right um yeah and i he's just we all have our brain trust right and you know it's like you know i check in with Bo. donald was agree but it's always informative and interesting you know, great conversation starting and, and heartening, like what the woman was saying about apathy, not apathy, uh, people wanting to community organize and do things and, you know, the world's on fire. I mean, I think that that's in everyone somewhere, the world's on fire and what are we going to do and how are we going to help each other and mutual aid and what does community do and then what does government do? These are, you know, separate but mutual aid kind of design design issues, right? Yeah. Indeed. No. <laughs> definitely fun. It'd be different if we could hang out in person, but we always have that kind of last minute hangout with it. It's very cute. Yeah. Not everybody's just loitering. But they, 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 they loiter. <laughs> we can't give them tea, but we can. What does Ben Boyce want to say? Ben, and, do you want, and to, don't you want to say anything? You're still recording, by the way, George. I don't know. Yeah, I know I am. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I would say, I would, uh, first of all, I, um, I've i been listening to your program for 21 years now. Wow. And it has uh, very much informed uh, the, I think, your, your dedication to um, clarity of word craft is is both inspiring and somewhat daunting i'm i'm afraid to ask questions because no, no, i no, know no. i'm going to get corrected <laughs> but no. it's it's a it is useful because a lot of the if we're going to engage in mystical thinking we should um have the correlative capacity of being able to think cognitively and systematically clearly and i to me i that's sort of what i've been aspiring to is to bring those two bodies of knowledge uh together in me the part of me that that has a 
very clearly defined cognitive frame and models for change. And, and you know, I have a very elaborated cosmology of, of how we're going to get from we're here to uh, our, our some kind of future destination. At the same time, I have no idea in any given moment exactly what's going to happen. So I think keeping that sense of, of humility about the fact that my grand unified field theory is not necessarily going to help me in this present moment. I have to just bring my presence to that and be receptive to what emerges in the moment. And it may surprise me. I may not know. What to do. That's, that's, I think I've learned from you. It's like how to be receptive to the unexpected. That, well, that partner, partner belief. with it, you know, partner yeah. with it. Come on in trickster, open the path, you know, and, and I loved um, hosting Joel Solomon once on radio about, you know, the clean money revolution kind of thing. And he said, we have a 50 year plan and a 500 year vision. I'm like, that's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> And um, and then I, I wanted also to to think of the the power of blessing. Um, you know, um, all cultures except for America really have a tradition of blessing, and that's what we need from the Middle East. And see, see, the oppressor actually seeks the medicine of what he oppresses is one of the things I work with. Um, it's it's um, you know England needed the metaphysic of India, so they invaded them, right? So underneath in the Middle East, it's a culture woven in which daily acts are woven together with blessing. Make a well for you, you know, um, you know how is your family? How is the, you know? Um, and and the Bedouin blessing is halu, change your direction and come this way, you know. Um, and I was saying to Deborah Felmuth, if Americans were more Bedouin, if we could put this in our brew, you know, we would we would say we would reframe refugees as pilgrims going, oh, hello, you know, you must have endured so much and suffered so much and have so many stories and they must be the stories that we need. Please come in, right? But the blessing, the art of blessing, it's a real form like a haiku or a sonnet. It's got, it's got a structure, a Saturn structure to it to potentize the blessing. And it's always sensual, right? Um, so like John O'Donoghue is sort of slightly reframed by myself, but um, when the ghost of loss stands behind you as you gaze out the window, then may the ancestors place a cloak around your shoulders that will mend your life. And when your boat is sinking in rough water, then may the moon spin a silver pathway upon which you may safely tread to shore. Um, and, you know, working with myself in different groups, you know, um, like conjure blessings. People are pretty good at when this horrible thing, but 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 they're terrible at then may this because it gets all abstract. Then may enlightenment or whatever or neoliberal capitalism, whatever. It's like where's the mango? Where's the cloak? Where's the where's the, where's the silver path? How do we paint images in our brains with words, right? Um, and, and, you know, part of irresistible eloquence available to all people who are willing, um, I think is part of the sensual part because that is really magnetic, you know, to, to paint the vision, like here's, here's, and, and see that, that is negotiating Middle East peace or, or whatever the, you know, it's like, where's the desirable vision? Wouldn't that be great, right? And then avenues of synchronicity open up that weren't apparent. And I remember once I had a seatmate who worked for the Department of Homeland Security. And I said, the situation's so grave, um, so dire, we can't afford the luxury of realism. And she goes, you have no idea how true that is. Right? <laughs> anyway, so, right, realism is a, is, a, is a luxury. Let's go for the ideal, like, wouldn't that be good? And that's why, you know, you, you know this from 20 years of listening, but we all have a magic mirror, right? So the secular critic in us does the necessary job of holding up the mirror going, look, it sucks in detail, right? And then, but that's just part one, without which you're just, you know, a colonial person. So critique, and then with a wave of the hand turns the mirror into a window, but look how cool it could be. Look at the beautiful, and then with another wave of the hand turns it into a door. Let's go there. Everybody with no prefrontal cortexes, this is where we're going. Um, and there's a great whoosh of like, this is where we're going, you know? Um, so, so all those stages are important, you know, and, and there's a lot of, you know, wonderfully smart, critical thinkers out there who are like, bah, da, bah, da, bah, da, bah, da, bah, bah. and you go, yeah, where's the vision and the door, right? That's part one, right? But critique without vision is complicitous with dominance, right? So again, oh, you know, yeah. 
Well put indeed. I'm going to stop the recording at this point.